In this video, we ask the question, is IPA safe? My last video on how to use your resin printer without gloves stirred up some controversy. Now the point of that video wasn't to convince you to not use gloves. It was more to show you that you can use a resin printer in an efficient and clean way and that it's nowhere near as messy as you might have thought. Nevertheless, we'll address the two key concerns that were raised. One, IPA will be absorbed into your skin as soon as it touches you and make you really, really sick. Two, you shouldn't use IPA inside a cheap ultrasonic cleaner because it could spark and set your house on fire. What I present and show you in this video is only there to help you make up your own mind. Ultimately, you are responsible for your own actions and your own safety. So make a choice, stand by your decision, and live with the consequences. To assist me with making my choice, I've used a risk matrix. For each potential risk, you analyze the likelihood of that risk and then the severity if it happens. By balancing these two, you can work out just how risky something is and then decide if you want to proceed or not. Let's start by examining the danger we face when we're exposed to IPA. The first place you should go when you're ever judging the risk of something is to look at the MSDS, a Material Safety Data Sheet. These are required by law and can often be found online as directed on the label. For this video, however, I went much further than that. I researched online like most people would, looking at a range of opinions and ideas. I also spoke to real people, science teachers. Why would their opinion be so important? Well, they do these things with kids. And duty of care means that if they get it wrong, they'll never work again. Now one thing I will say about MSDSs is, is that they're written from the worst case scenario. I'm not saying you should ignore everything that's in them, but keep in mind that companies have to cover themselves against litigation in case something goes wrong. They simply can't risk saying that something has no adverse effect and then being sued by someone who has a freak reaction to it. When we look at an example MSDS for IPA, it does say not to touch the skin, but there's definitely more to it than that. My first piece of evidence is this, rubbing alcohol. If we look at the ingredients for this, it is isopropyl alcohol, water, and fragrance. Now this stuff has been used for a long time to be directly sprayed onto skin. You know what the doctor before they give you a needle and they put the alcohol swab on? Isopropyl alcohol. This is also sold as a cure for acne and swimmer's ear, which means you spray it into your ear to disperse the water and to stop it from being trapped and giving you a bad time. So how is it that this one is designed to be sprayed onto your skin, even open wounds as directed on the label, but this one is the work of the devil? There is a key difference in that this one is rated at 70% and this one over 90%. The missing ingredient that makes up the extra 30% in this is simply water. Does that mean we can be safe if we pour out 30% of this and then fill it back up with water? Well, you can decide that. The point I'm trying to make is that isopropyl alcohol does have risk, but it's not automatic death. It's been administered direct to the skin for many, many years, quite often by doctors, and in these minimal dosages, there's definitely nothing unsafe about it. In fact, if you study the MSDS for isopropyl alcohol, you'll find that touching the skin is one of your least concerns. Your main danger comes from ingesting it, which means swallowing, and if you do that, you're gonna have a really bad day. Almost as risky as getting it in your eyes. So really what we should all be doing is wearing safety glasses whenever we're spraying this, but no one ever talks about that. Fumes. It does evaporate quickly, putting its fumes through the room, and that's why in my last video I addressed ventilation, because if you're not careful, it can give you a nasty headache. The next most dangerous after these three other areas is touching it with your skin. It's generally accepted that occasional and minimal exposure will simply evaporate and leave you with no adverse effects. Prolonged exposure, however, can dry out your skin and cause irritation. Now, I would like to point out the obvious here and state that the impact on health is gonna vary for each individual. Unfortunately, some people will have a significant reaction the first time it touches their skin. And for those people, they should definitely wear gloves and see if they can even avoid it altogether. The other thing that's quite relevant here is the weight and size of the individual. In the documentation that I researched, the risk goes up with the parts per million count of the substance. This means that the more of it you're exposed to, the greater risk you have of getting sick. This also means that for a given amount, the smaller you are, the greater impact it will have on your health. The science teachers quite rightly pointed out that IPA is much more dangerous for children. Because they're smaller in size and weight, what is considered a small exposure for adults is much more significant for children and they should definitely wear gloves. As I've already touched on, the amount of exposure and the risk to your health goes up together on a sliding scale. If you come into occasional contact with small amounts of IPA, it's just going to evaporate and unless you're very unlucky, that's going to be the end of it. If you are working in an industrial setting with these types of resins all of the time, then your exposure is going to be much higher. 
In this case, it's gonna have a cumulative effect and you should always wear gloves to prevent it building up over time. The science teachers also pointed out that because it's a solvent, it will absorb other liquids and then that increases the chance of you then absorbing those with enough exposure. It's possible that somebody using IPA to clean up another resin mistakenly thinks that IPA has made them sick when in fact the resin is mixed with the IPA and that's what's gone into their system. So that's the results of my research into skin contact with IPA. And I implore you once again, make up your own mind. Personally, I have no reaction at all when a little bit touches my skin. If you review my last video, you'll see that for normal printing, I don't even touch the IPA. I use tweezers the whole time and I'm very confident that I don't need to change anything with my practice there. What is possibly hazardous, however, is cleaning the vat. In this instance, there's much more chance of the IPA touching my fingers. Although I think with the technique that I showed, generally I was holding the clean end of something at most stages. You could definitely make a case for wearing gloves if you were cleaning out the vat. Again, it's your decision to make. Personally, I find I'm only doing that job once every couple of months. Therefore, my exposure is very small and I have no reactions, so I'm happy to keep doing it the way that I have been. Now let's get to the fiery part. How dangerous is IPA in a cheap ultrasonic cleaner? I tested this one out practically. Now to start with, a quick refresher on fires. The vast majority of fires work on the following principle. A fire exists when we have air, fuel and heat. Take away any one of those and the fire extinguishes. If you put water on a common fire, it cools the fire to below the combustion point. When you use a fire blanket, it takes away the oxygen. When you turn off the gas on your barbecue, it takes away the fuel source. For a fire to start and be maintained, we need all three of these things. So with that in mind, let's investigate. Our first test is to pour some liquid IPA on my official sandstone testing rock. I've set up this lovely black background so we can see any flames as clearly as possible. Igniting the IPA with a naked flame causes it to catch on fire. No surprises there because IPA can be used as a fuel source for some fires. You can see as the flame continues, it's slow and steady and the fuel source evaporates on the rock. As soon as the fuel runs out, no more fire. Our next test is to fill up a small container full of IPA. This means that we'll be giving off fumes and we can test if the gas ignites. As the MSDS warned us, the fumes are in fact flammable and it does ignite. We can, however, quickly extinguish the fire by smothering it. Here I take a very flammable piece of paper from a book, put it on top, and even though I've added more fuel, we've removed the oxygen and the fire is immediately put out. So yes, we've proved the obvious. IPA is in fact flammable, but so are a number of things we have in our daily lives. Spray cooking oil, commonly found in kitchens, is intensely flammable. Another well-known one is spray deodorant and sometimes even hairspray. What? what? I was not expecting that. Time to put our flammability test in context by introducing the ultrasonic cleaner. Now for this to work without a naked flame, we're relying on a spark to come from the electronics within the ultrasonic cleaner. There are two types commonly available cheaply on eBay. One has a removable tray, which I haven't purchased and therefore can't comment on, and the other one has a tray that's fixed inside the machine. You can see here with my exploration that there's no gaps to the inside of the machine. The chamber where the IPA resides is completely sealed from the electronics. This should mean that any spark from the electronics should be completely isolated and not possible to combust the mixture. Even so, let's see if the naked flame around the opening can cause ignition. Here I put a naked flame around the lid, testing to see if there's any vapor escaping that could cause a fire. I'm pleased to say that even though this is a cheap machine, there's definitely not. I did learn, however, that if you leave the flame on the lid for long enough, the actual lid will catch on fire, so watch out for that. Just to make sure we're being thorough, let's purposely ignite the gas and see how hard it is to put out. We open the lid, introduce the naked flame, and as expected, the mixture combusts. All we have to do to put it out is to close the lid, remove the oxygen, and after a couple of seconds, the fire comes to an end. Now by this point, I was pretty confident that this wasn't actually gonna be a safety hazard. All right, here we go. The cleaner is set up in the room operating. Naked flame, once again, no ignition. Open the lid, a little spectacular show, but I close the lid and there is no danger. The take home point here is definitely to be in the room whenever you're using your ultrasonic cleaner if you have IPA inside. In the extremely unlikely event that it does catch on fire, simply closing the lid will put it out quickly. Once again, I suggest to you to make up your own mind. Be responsible, make an informed decision and then stand by it instead of blaming anyone else. Coming back to our risk matrix, I can decide that I accept the risk of this setup. I think the likelihood of this event happening is very minuscule. The severity could in fact be catastrophic, but the control measure to put in place to lower this significantly is to simply be in the room. It's also a good idea to employ some common sense and have things like smoke detectors in the room where you have your 3D printers. 
Well, that's it from me. That's what I've got to say on the matter, and it's up to you to make your own opinion. If you disagree with me, well, you're entitled to. All I ask is that if you do, you do so constructively. There's some definite food for thought here, so safe and happy printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.